So this morning then, as we come to God's Word together, we're going to take a look at a passage of Scripture that is often read at Christmas time. You may feel like you're already over Christmas because it's just a few days later, but that'll be okay because as you'll see, it's perhaps not so Christmassy in its timing as some people think it is. But as we look at this text, and it's in Matthew chapter 2, if you want to turn there in your Bibles, we'll be reminded from what we see there and hopefully encouraged that God is always one step ahead, many millions of steps in reality, but metaphorically speaking, one step ahead of whatever this world may throw at us. And because of that, his plans and purposes will always be accomplished. And then as an added bonus, we as his people get to play a part in God's plans and purposes as he works in us and through us for his Glory. So as we look at this chapter, we come to the point in the Christmas story where Jesus has already been born and the news has started to get around. And not everybody was happy about this news, especially old King Herod, who, as we'll see, devises a plan to try and stop God's plan. And so no prizes for guessing how that turned out for him. And as we'll also see, in spite of Herod's attempts to mess up God's plans, God's plans still prevail as they always do. So the title of this morning's message then is God is in control, really. So let's pray and we'll take a look at God's word together. Father, we're thankful for your word, the word of truth. And this morning, Lord, we all need to be shaped by your word. We need encouragement, direction, comfort, even correction. And as believers, we submit ourselves to your word. I pray if there's any that do not know you as Lord and Saviour at this moment, Lord, that you would reveal yourself through your word. So we pray, Father, that you'd have your way now, in Jesus' name. Amen. So reading from verse 1 then, Matthew chapter 2, it says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and come to worship him. So as we know, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and as it says there in verse 1, this is now speaking about a time after the birth of Jesus, when Herod was still the reigning king in Jerusalem. Bethlehem, of course, was a very insignificant town in people's minds. To us, it's, wow, Bethlehem, where Jesus was born. But remember, in the day, to the people, it was Bethlehem. Even though it was the ancestral town of great King David. This particular King Herod mentioned here was known as Herod the Great, and was first in a line of several important Herodian rulers. He was a king who loved opulence and power. He inflicted incredibly heavy taxes on the people. And in his later years, he had frequent fits of rage and jealousy, which led him to kill many of his close associates. He also had a deep fascination for grand building projects, the greatest being the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. And we're also introduced here in verse 1, to those very well-known characters, the wise men. And I will apologise, this is the first in a series of spoilers, um, but it doesn't say that there were only three of them. Though we have the nativity scenes, and we do ourselves. Historically, it would have been more likely that there was a a whole company of men who were travelling together. And the idea that there was only three typically came from the fact that only three gifts are mentioned. These wise men were known as magi, coming from the the root word in the original language, which meant they were astronomers of sorts. With a knowledge of the Hebrew scriptures, which dated back to the time of Daniel, probably because of the influence of the Jewish people that were exiled to the east previously. So they weren't actually kings. Sorry, that's another spoiler here. But these wise men had a purpose for their trip. And we see in verse 2, they ask, Where is he who has been born king 
of the Jews. For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. So what was their reason for wanting to find Jesus? To worship him. Now the sign that these wise men had been given of Jesus' birth and the location of it was a star, which they had seen from when they were back in the eastern regions. We don't know exactly how they were guided by the star to get to this point. Of course, there's many theories. But there is little evidence to suggest it was a conjunction of planets like we had a few days ago because of the way the star continues to lead them and the way it is spoken of moving and how specifically it guides them to where Jesus was. We'll see that there was almost a a general guidance in this beginning point and then there was a very specific guidance. So at this point, the star wasn't guiding them specifically as much as it was signifying some way according to their astronomical calculations that the birth had taken place. And then it could have been many months on when they actually got to Herod. <clears throat> we know it's a very general guidance because, of course, they end up at Herod's palace. They don't end up at the stable where Jesus was born. The bottom line was these wise men knew that this was no ordinary baby, but instead was one who had been born king of the Jews. Again, to us as Christians here today, that's a noble, honourable title. But to many at this time, it would almost have been a laughable statement. King of the Jews. Not just referring to a baby as a king, but to say king of the Jews was laughable because the Jewish people were so often despised and dishonoured because of their unique customs and beliefs. Now, being a king himself at that time, Herod obviously had ears around town, and so it came to his attention that there were these visiting wise men looking for another king so they could worship him. <clears throat> that news was not good for King Herod's ego. Look at verse 3. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. So I guess he was not the only one who was upset. It is possible the rest of Jerusalem were troubled because they knew how King Herod would react to such a threat, to such competition. Or it could have been because of the size and majesty of this large company of wise men who had arrived. We don't know exactly. Verse 4 and when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea. For thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. Of course, that was the last thing that Herod really wanted to do. The truth was he felt totally threatened by the news of Christ's birth, and so he did all that he could to join the dots, to find out where this Jesus was as quick as he could, so that he could eliminate the threat to his throne. This was just... Herod's way of dealing with things, and there's historical data that points to this. William Barclay in his commentary says of Herod, he had no sooner come to the throne than he began by annihilating the Sanhedrin. He slaughtered 300 court officers, he murdered his wife, Mary Amne, and her mother Alexandra, his eldest son, Antipater, and two other sons, Alexander and Aristobulus. So this was a king you did not want to upset. In verse 4 here, we read about the chief priests and scribes that Herod summoned to himself, and we see that they knew their Bibles. In response to Herod's request, they simply go to the Scriptures, quoting from Micah 5 verse 2, where it was prophesied that Jesus would be born in this very unlikely place of Bethlehem. And this was just one of over 300 prophecies that relate specifically to the life of Jesus, showing us over and over again that God knows the future and God is in control of the future because God determines the future. 
and that Christ was who he said he was without shadow of doubt. Children, here's the first point for you on your sheets this morning. It was God's plan for Jesus to come to earth and be born as a baby in Bethlehem before the world was even created. Think about that, kids. Not just before you were made, but before the entire world, the entire universe was made. It was God's plan to send Jesus to earth. So ironically then, as one who had no desire to submit to God, King Herod pays attention, in a sense, to what the scriptures say. His theology isn't so off here, but it shows you that you can have good theology and the wrong conclusion or the wrong application. He presses the wise men for some more specific information <clears throat> excuse me, about when the star appeared. He then figures that as the wise men wanted to find Jesus anyway, he might as well trick them into finding him so they could bring him back to Herod, forgetting that they were actually wise men. They weren't going to fall for this. So he speaks to the wise men in secret. He didn't want anyone else getting to Jesus before they did. And at this point, the wise men seemed to go along with the plan. In verse 9, when they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them. And here we see a very different description of the way this star is directing them. Till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. Now again, another spoiler alert. Not so much because I'm giving away something that happens, but rather it's the part that often upsets people who hold a little too tightly to the traditional Christmas story. But it's a great thing that as believers, we have traditions which are wonderful, but we happily bring those traditions under the truth of the word of God. And sometimes people think this happened in a way different to the way it actually did happen. So the wise men leave Herod's presence and the star that they'd seen in the east appears to move ahead of them, appearing and reappearing and then comes to rest exactly over the point where Jesus was. Again, this is another reason why it wouldn't make sense for it to be a star out in the depths of space that effectively would have been shining over half the earth. If you, I missed it, the other night, but if you got to see the planet's conjunction the other night and somebody told you that, you know, there was a pot of money underneath it, you would have said, that's not very specific. Half the world's underneath it right now. This was more of a localised star, maybe more similar, certainly in the way that it operated to the fire and the cloud that led Israel in the wilderness. It was obviously close, visible, and the words came and stood over there literally means the star was right above where Jesus was. There was no mistaking that this was the right place. There was some star of some kind saying, this house right here, not number 42, not number 46, number 44. It's right here. And the bit that gets spoiled for some, of course, and I must admit when I found out, I was like, oh, oh well is rather than the star being over a stable or a manger scene with Jesus as a tiny baby and three wise men giving the gifts, the truth was the star actually stopped over a house. I thought it would be cool to start a new line of nativity scenes. There, w- there will be great conversation starters for the gospel. Someone comes in your house, they see this house with a star, and they're like, oh, that's a posh-looking stable. <gasps> Let me tell you something. And the look at verse 11, it says, When they come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. Now, most Bible scholars believe that, as you add things up here, by this point, Jesus was anywhere between six months, but more likely up to 18 months or even two years old, which we can deduce ourselves because of the age range that Herod picks in the next few verses. So this means that rather than the wise men finding Jesus laying in a manger or crib of some sort, he was more likely playing outside with his friends. It kind of messes up our manger scene a little bit, doesn't it? But it's also worth noting here that against all tradition and the typical custom, the child here is mentioned before his mother. 
That was just not done when you spoke of a family. And the point is being made here of the significance of this child. There's no mention of Joseph. This didn't mean he was not around at this time. He's just not mentioned as being there at this particular time. So let me encourage you to put aside the traditions for a moment so you don't miss the wonder of what is happening here, what truly happened here. These wise men who were seeking Jesus found Jesus. And as soon as they do, they fall down and worship him. Though these men were not kings, they were very important dignitaries and it would have been a very powerful scene to see them bowing in worship before the child Jesus. So you have to adjust the picture in your mind a little bit, but let's do that. Linger for a moment in, in what actually happened, the majesty of the true scene here, where there's potentially a whole company of dignitaries bowing in worship before a toddler. It's very different, isn't it? A toddler who happens to be God in the flesh. Now, in what we've looked at so far, I hope it's been very clear to us that in this story, which is not just a story, of course, but history, God is obviously completely in control of all the events taking place and everything is going according to plan. The wise men have the perfect response in light of this fact that God is above all things, that God is working out all things according to his plans and purposes. What do they do? They worship Jesus. And that's the first point here in the outline. Jesus is to be worshipped because Jesus is God. That's the first and most appropriate response when you recognise and are reminded that God is orchestrated. He's in control of all things. He rules. He has to be because he is God. And just think for a moment what a privilege it is that as believers, we get to worship Jesus. That's not just sing songs about Jesus. That's to worship, to bow. And it's a position of the heart, whether we bow physically or not. May that be more of a priority in our lives in this next year. That we worship the God who is in control no matter what is happening. True, heartfelt worship. I was struck a number of years ago when I was in Singapore with one of my daughters and we were looking around the city there and of course there's a whole load of, of pagan worship and we see this big huge <coughs> Buddha in the middle of the street and a lady walks along with her little boy and she stops and she puts some money in the little slot and then she bows down and worships and then she carries on then we walk down the road and there's this temple and there's these people coming out, businessmen, they go in, they get some incense, they come out and they worship the sun god or whatever. And but what struck me there was, here they are worshipping a false god, but I was really impacted by the fact that as Christians, you don't always see that same kind of commitment and zeal to just boldly and publicly if we need to worship our God we, we like to be a little bit more sanitized and here they are just I oh, worship my God and stand in the middle of the street we get to worship the true God Jesus Christ now as part of their worship of course the wise men give their well-known gifts continuing on in verse 11 when they opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now it was common, especially in the East, that no one would ever appear before royalty or a person of importance without bringing gifts. Considering who these wise men believed the young child to be, it's not surprising they gave such lavish gifts. And again, this is where the idea of three men come from, because there were three gifts. And it's often said that the gold speaks of royalty, the incense speaks of divinity, and myrrh speaks of death, which is true in a sense, but we, we don't necessarily have any evidence that that's what the wise men specifically meant. 
or that they were aware of this. They just wanted to honor this king of the Jews. But these were very precious gifts, very costly gifts, and very practical gifts of provision. They would have helped Joseph and Mary for many months to come. They would have helped to fund their trip to Egypt and back. Now, if we step back from the story here for a moment and look at it through human eyes, we could say at this point, Jesus, the baby Jesus, the toddler Jesus, could have been very vulnerable. There was every possibility that following this greeting and act of worship and giving of the gifts, the wise men could have just done what Herod said and bring Mary, Joseph and Jesus back to Herod and we know how that would have turned out. But fortunately, we can rest on a point of truth in which is great encouragement. Because God was the one in control here, we can know that God was the one orchestrating these events, not Herod. Herod was the greatest authority. He, he called the shots. But he wasn't the greatest authority. And he wasn't calling the shots. God was. God was orchestrating. The fact was, at no point were Jesus, Mary, or Joseph vulnerable. Because it wasn't God's plan for them to be taken back to Herod. Neither were the wise men vulnerable. And we see the Lord wanted to protect them too. Do you believe that God is the one orchestrating all the events in your life too? Had you struggled at certain points in the last year believing that God was orchestrating all the events in your life? Did you feel vulnerable? You never are vulnerable as a child of God. Never. Because God is the one orchestrating the events. God is not going to let his plan be messed up. So all he has to do here is communicate to the wise men that they shouldn't go back to Herod and they will be safe. And that's what he does next in verse 12. Then, being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. These wise men were God-fearing men. They had a desire to find Jesus, to worship him, and God takes care of them. Because they didn't realize the danger that they were in if they went back to Herod empty-handed. Then God communicates the same message to Joseph and Mary, as they were the ones looking after Jesus. Verse 13, Now when they departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt and stay there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And so again, this, initially you may have thought, oh, it's a Christmas message, but we're already past Christmas. But no, because this is past Christmas. In fact, the little picture may have caught you off guard if you look on the front of the bulletin because you might have thought it was Mary and Joseph going to have the baby but if you look Mary's actually carrying a baby because it's Mary and Joseph going to Egypt she already has the baby with her <coughs> now just to make sure Joseph really got the point here of how serious this was the Lord makes it crystal clear he gives a lot more detail to Joseph than he gave the wise men telling him specifically that Herod wanted to destroy the child Jesus Herod had not revealed his true motives to anyone but see here how God knows exactly what he's up to and he continues to work out his perfect plan perfectly. The Lord tells Joseph to go to Egypt and wait there until he gives him further instructions. And I love how Joseph responds to God's instructions, which were not going to be easy to follow. Verse 14, when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt and there and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I called my son. Joseph didn't have any time to procrastinate about the Lord's instruction. God said it, he obeyed it, and that night he started his journey to Egypt with Mary and Jesus. This would have not have been an easy journey to Egypt. It doesn't say there he departed on Air Egypt Flight 632 in business class. This was a rough journey. No travel was fun in those days. We don't know how long they were there, but it could have been a short while, still even potentially years. So this was inconvenient, really, for Mary and Joseph. It wasn't easy, but it was necessary. And it was part of God's will. Now jumping ahead of the story, in verse 15, we are told that Joseph and Mary and Jesus stayed in Egypt until Herod was dead though that hasn't happened yet in the narrative. It will be a few verses down. And Matthew also makes the connection here between 
the flight to Egypt, and the prophecy, another prophecy quoted from Hosea 11, verse 1, saying that God's son will be called out of Egypt. And so you see, God's word, hundreds of years previous, decrees exactly what would happen because God is in control. And we see here a principle that is echoed throughout the New Testament and that can help us to rest in the fact that God is orchestrating the events in our lives. And that is this. Joseph, Mary and the wise men allowed themselves to be guided by God's word, whether it made sense or not, and whether it was convenient or not, and as a result, they were safe in the will of God. Joseph, Mary, and the wise men allow themselves to be guided by God's word. And we have all of what God wants to say to us today in his word. We don't have to rely on God speaking to us through some dream or something. He's given us everything we need to be guided in life. Sometimes it doesn't make sense to us. It is still God's word to us. Sometimes it's not convenient to us. It is still best for us. And it's what keeps us safe in the will of God. And when we say safe in the will of God, this doesn't mean safe from any harm, any difficulty, any suffering. It means true safety. So even if we do suffer, we are in the will of God. So ponder that for a moment. How are we allowing God's word to guide us? How have we allowed God's word to guide us in this past year as things in our lives maybe were tipped upside down a little bit, shaken up a little bit? Did we come to the word of God for direction? Did we lose our way a little? As we come into this next year, let us resolve by God's grace to let his word guide us, to go to his word for answers, to rest in his word for our stability. Remember what we're told in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. I haven't read all the details, but I understand there is a um, specifically required, suggested COVID kit we should take everywhere with us. I don't think one of the items on the list is a Bible. But I can tell you that if you only have the Bible, you're going to be okay. I'm not saying you shouldn't have some of those other things as well. But our hope is in the Word of God which doesn't always lead us in a safe or easy path. Remember, and we were reminded of this as a family as we watched a a fun family Christmas movie the other night, yet it very powerfully portrayed the struggle it may have been for Mary and Joseph as they could not find anywhere to have the baby, the Messiah, and being so sure that this was truly God's son being born, You put yourself in their shoes, maybe they thought, well, as we navigate round, there'll be an open inn and we'll say, oh, thank you, Lord, clearly God provided. But there is none, and they're running out of time. And with the artistic license in this particular movie, then Joseph reassures Mary and says, this is part of God's plan. But that was true. It wasn't easy, it was difficult, but it wasn't because God's plan was being messed up and God was saying, I don't believe it, I haven't gone in sorted, what was I thinking? It was exactly how he intended it to be. God's plan is not being constantly messed up and adjusted and changed as he runs around and tries to work it all together. His plan is being carried out perfectly all the time. And God's plans will still be carried out in this world whether we obey his word or not. It's just that we won't get to experience the fullness and the blessing of being a part of his plans unless we follow his word and seek to put him first. So eventually Herod realizes the wise men are not coming back. His plan was falling apart. Continuing on in verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry. And he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem in all its districts from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, A voice was heard in Ramah lamentation, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. So in response to the realization that his plan had failed, he reacts in anger. And of course, what we know of Herod, this was nothing to him. It horrifies us to see this terrible act of infanticide 
ordering all of the male children in the districts of Bethlehem who were aged two and under to be put to death. Just an unimaginable scene of tragedy for the hundreds of mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters of those children as they were taken and killed before their very eyes. Herod was so threatened by the challenge to his throne, even though Jesus was only a child, he wipes out every male child in the age range in his region in the hope that among them, this child Jesus would be there. Matthew then quotes from Jeremiah 31, 15, indicating a truth for us that should be a comfort, even though we can't understand it, and that was that even this evil, wicked act was somehow allowed as part of God's plan. God was not the author of this wicked act, nor was he responsible for it, but neither were his plans and purposes hindered by it. Neither was this a moment where God said, this is not what I wanted to happen. It's all going wrong. God remained perfectly in control. And as I've told myself and others that many times when facing challenging situations that don't make sense, of which there will be many this side of heaven, something I heard a pastor say years ago, I've never forgotten, you've heard me say it many times, when confronted by what you don't know, fall back on what you do know. I don't know why these poor babies and families suffered in this horrific way, but I do know that God is in control, that he's perfectly loving, merciful, just and fair. And though it doesn't make sense now, one day it will. So what we see here then, God was still in control even when it looked like things had gone completely out of control. You see, the trouble is we might feel that we can have a spiritual perspective and we say, God's in control, God's in control. But when things get beyond whatever our threshold is, we can then come to that point of saying, is God in control? Because this is really, really, really bad. So... The authorities that existed at the time sought to put a spanner in God's works, but it didn't work for them. We are entering into a time where you can guarantee the authorities that exist at this time are seeking and will continue to seek to put a spanner in the works of God's people. But it won't work. It never works for anyone who tries to get in the way of God's plans and purposes. Children, here's the second point for you on your sheets. Are you ready for this? When God plans for something to happen, it will happen. When God plans for something to not happen, it won't happen. God's plans will always work out. See, kids, God can do whatever he wants, and his plans will always work out. No one can stop them. Isn't that awesome? No one. No king no government, no big gun or anything can stop God. Psalm 115 verse 3 reminds us of this where it says, but our God is in heaven, he does whatever he pleases. I'll put that point back for the kids. Our God is in heaven, he does whatever he pleases. God's plans will endure, man's plans will fail. Verse 19 really brings this point home as we read in verse 19. Now when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the young child's life are dead. Joseph, Mary, you're safe. I've taken care of Herod. He's dead. He won't bother you again. So go back to Israel. And we pick things up from there. Verse 21, then he arose, notice Joseph's instant obedience again, took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. Now as we read on, we might find some comfort here to know that even God's obedient children have doubts and fears that can cause them to hold back from doing what they know to do. Verse 22, but when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea instead of his father Herod. He was afraid to go there. And being warned by God in a dream, he turned aside to the region of Galilee. Joseph had good reason to fear because Herod's son was worse than his father. But his fear 
did not disqualify him from being used by God. It just proved that he was human. What mattered was what Joseph did with his fears. Christians are not those people who never fear anything. It's what Christians do with their fears that makes a difference. Joseph's fears were taken away by the assurance of the word of God. It's the same for us too. It's the only place to go to find relief from fear, to find something greater than our fear to allow us to move forward. So Joseph is led by the word of God and brought to the place God wants him to be. Verse 23, And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Now it's interesting what's written here in verse 23, because there is no specific recorded prophecy that Matthew appears to be quoting from. Some think that Matthew meant the Messiah would be a Nazarite. To be a Nazarite was to commit oneself to a special vow of consecration described in number 6. But it seems that Matthew is more focused on the connection to the town of Nazareth than being a Nazarite. One commentator has suggested this is not meant to be a quotation of a specific passage, but a summary of a theme of prophetic expectation, meaning that because of the reputation that Nazareth had, people literally said what good could ever come out of Nazareth, this was a sense of fulfillment of a humble and rejected Messiah coming. Like, it fulfills prophecy that he's a humble and rejected Messiah because here he is in Nazareth. He's not in the best town in the region. And in the ultimate plan of God, the fact was the Messiah grew up in this despised town. Jesus will be known as Jesus of Nazareth and his followers, Nazarenes. When Jesus revealed himself to Paul on the road to Damascus, he introduced himself to Paul saying, I am Jesus of Nazareth. Acts 22.8. And I love what one Bible commentator says about Jesus' time in Nazareth. He said, Growing up in Nazareth, Jesus would develop in maturity from a boy to a man. He would have fulfilled the responsibilities expected of an eldest son. And eventually, when Joseph disappeared from the scene, likely after his death, Jesus became the man of the family. He worked his trade, supported his family, loved his heavenly father, and proved himself utterly faithful in a thousand small things before he formally entered his appointed ministry. Yet no one would be intimidated to meet a man from Nazareth. The tendency would be to immediately think of oneself better than anybody from Nazareth. So it's all part of God's plan, where Jesus would be born, where he would grow up and live, and where he would die. Children, here's your third and final point this morning. God has a plan for your life, and nothing can mess that up. Trust him with all your heart and remember he is with you always. This is so very true, children, that God does have a plan, a place for you, a purpose for you. And if you trust him, nothing can mess that up. And he's always with you. And for us, One further point here, and then we'll just take a moment to reflect on this, is this. God had a plan and a purpose for the wise men, for Herod, for Jesus, and for Joseph and Mary, and his plans and purposes were carried out perfectly for his glory. God had a plan and a purpose for the wise men, for Herod, for Jesus, for Joseph and Mary, and his plans and purposes were carried out perfectly for his glory. As we read the Christmas story Everything that happened, every detail, God planned it that way. He was not catching up with the events. So just in reflection on what we've looked at in this chapter, there were some significant potential obstacles and hindrances to God's plans and purposes from the governing authorities, but that didn't stop them being carried out. God did what he needed to do to guide and direct Joseph and Mary, not to an easier path, or just a safe path, but the best path, the path of his will. And the wise man and Joseph and Mary responded in willing obedience to God's direction through his word. As a result, they remained in the will of God. And of course, behind the scenes in all this, with the prophecies being fulfilled, it's clear to us 
that what we are reading is God's script being carried out. He's the author, and it was written before the foundation of the world. So thinking about this personally, again, God has a plan for your life. He has a plan for my life. It is not always easy. It is not always safe. It is not without doubts and fears, but he has a plan and it will be accomplished because God is in control, really. Ephesians 2, 8 to 10 from the New Testament tells us, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, and the bit I want to focus on here, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You have been saved for works that God prepared beforehand. That's a plan. What's the best way we can respond to the fact that our God is in control of all things at all times? I'll suggest four things that we've seen in our passage today of how we can respond as we go into this new year. Firstly, worship. That's, the, again, the primary, most appropriate way to respond to our God who is in control of all things, to truly worship him, to have none before him, to have our affections for him. Secondly is to trust, which means to trust that he is orchestrating the events. If you think back of whatever the last year was like for you and whatever this next year will be like for you, trust is where we say it doesn't matter what it looks like, God is orchestrating these events. And thirdly, what is so important to enable us to endure and navigate through events that may not look like God is in control is obedience to his word. Not just when we're not in lockdown or when we are in lockdown at all times. Not just when it's convenient, but when it's inconvenient because it's best for us to worship, to trust, to walk in obedience. But there's a fourth thing that I think is certainly implied here in the character of the people we've been reading about and is very appropriate for us, and that's simply appreciation. This isn't some hard, in bondage, following of a dictator. This is the opportunity to worship, trust and obey the God of the universe who's given his son for us and saved us to rule and reign with him for all eternity. So we appreciate the fact that we get to be a part of his plan. And one final scripture I'll leave you with, you know, the one I try and put in every sermon, Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Maybe you haven't written out your New Year's resolutions next year, your plan, but guess what? God has. He's already done it. It would be easier if he would email it to us as a PDF attachment, I admit. It doesn't work that way. But as you consider this past year, maybe your plans were messed up, but guess what? God's plans weren't. Maybe next year, your plans may get messed up, but God's plans won't be. So be encouraged that no matter what anyone else tries to do to hinder and obstruct God's plan for you, it won't work. His plans and purposes will prevail because he is in control, really. Amen? Let's pray and we'll have a time of communion together. Father, we thank you for the hope we find in your word. And even as we look at a story that is so very common to us, there is so much rich truth that can really impact and affect our lives in a significant way. Help us to worship, to trust, to obey and to appreciate the part that we get to play in your plans and purposes in this world. Help us to not resist, help us to not be a hindrance, but help us to yield that you might be glorified in us and through us. And thank you, Lord, that even as we this morning may still have lingering fears or doubts, that we can bring them before you and be aligned by your word to your will.
in Jesus' name. Amen.